Um, I have no other speaker cards at this time. Okay, we will move on then on our agenda. The next item is item three, and uh, members, uh, I will be recusing myself uh, from any discussion or deliberation of, uh, or decisions on this item uh, by virtue of the fact that uh, one of the members of one of the five project teams is a company that I had as a past client. I don't have any current relationship with them, but I'll be recusing myself from this. Um, Vice Chair Lynn Shank uh, has graciously agreed to uh, preside over this portion of the agenda. I'll be stepping out of the room uh, for this item. Thank you. The chairman has left the room. Okay. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'd, I'd like to just make sure that the record reflects and that the audience knows that uh, within the confines of the uh, uh, Brown Act and Keen Bagley, etc., that the, the members of this authority took a real deep dive uh, and the staff has been very, very generous with their time in helping us individually to uh, review this and understand it and uh, to answer our questions. So with that, Tom. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board, um, Mr. Ruloff Van Ark. Um, what we're going to discuss today uh, for item number three is the uh, request for proposal construction package number one. And um, we're going to ask the board to approve the RFP based upon the term sheet uh, secondly, to approve the stipend that we're suggesting, and then finally, approve the RFP evaluation criteria. Okay, that's good. Um, this construction package number one is uh, a design-build construction package, and the um, high-speed rail authority has the legal authority to enter into a design-build procurements, and this is in the public resources code, there's a specific statute that allows that. The reasons to select a design bill procurement as opposed to uh, other types like design bid build is that it can save money, time, and, and result in fewer disputes. And the reason for that is because um, the owner is um, transferring some of the risks over to the design builder and it provides an opportunity for innovation and in the delivery of the, of the project and also, uh, like I had mentioned, can save time and money. There are five construction packages in the initial construction sec section in the Central Valley. This is the first of the five, the most northern piece that goes through the city of Fresno. The first four packages are to lay the track, um, pre-track work. The fifth one is to lay the track over the entire length. And so the scope of this particular construction package is, is um, uh, going to be shown on a map and also the timeline. <coughs> this slide shows the initial construction section, uh, which is a total of either 100, and, well, between 130 miles and 80 miles, depending on which selection uh, on the routes are, are taken and also uh, the expenses associated with those. In addition, there are two planned stations along this route. Uh, those would be at Fresno and Kings to Larry. The next slide shows um, a more detailed description and picture of the package, uh, construction package number one. As you can see, it goes from Avenue 17 on the north, most northern piece down to um, uh, the uh, East American Avenue. There are three options. The first one, uh, CP1A, is a, a length of approximately 23 miles. Um, CP1B 
is a one mile length through the station at Fresno and then CP1C is a five mile section of the south end that takes you through the metropolitan or urban area of the city of Fresno. Um, let me just point out too that there is a, a note on here that says it depends, uh, this route is dependent on the rod knot. As you know, you haven't voted on that yet. And so um, this that's being depicted here in the most northern piece you can see goes along the BNSF route and that is depicting the preferred alternative that you had selected earlier in the meeting. And so that's why we're describing it this way. But uh, you, you will be deciding the final route in the environmental process when you certify that environmental document. This is just shows a timeline for this construction package number one. Uh, as you can see, we're asking for the board's approval of the term sheet that represents the critical terms in this construction package to, uh, the meeting today. Uh, the authority is required to go before the Public Works Board to uh, seek their approval. We're now on calendar for their approval on March 9th. Um, assuming we get the approvals from this board and from the Public Works Board, we'll be then issuing the RFP to the shortlisted proposers and as you uh, no, because we've been keeping you updated. There are five shortlisted proposal teams at this time. Uh, we've had some one-on-ones that we um, gathered some information from them to help us modify and, and refine the term sheet, which you uh, have in front of you, and we think uh, it's, it's much improved. Um, so on the March 16th, we'll share this term sheet. It's, it's a because this is a procurement process, it's a confidential uh, RFP um, that we'll be sharing with them and then uh, they're going to be putting together their proposals between March 16th and we expect those to be submitted uh, August or September. Then in uh, later in the year 2012 we'll be evaluating those uh, proposals uh, for the purpose of selection. We expect to award the contract um, sometime at the end of 2012 and we think uh, we'll have to come before the board for your approval on that RFP and then sometime in early 2013 we'll, there will be a notice to proceed. As you can see the, the date for completion of this uh, construction package which is now estimated to be about 1.5 billion dollars would be uh, in the middle of 2016. Uh, we have um, a few people here who are going to make uh, presentations on various aspects of the RFP. Uh, first, we're going to have a small business enterprise uh, policy and goal presentation by Pat Padilla, president of uh, Padilla and Associates. And then um, the right of way uh, is going to be discussed too because that is uh, on the critical path for this and it's um, the responsibility of, of this high speed rail board to acquire the property. And that will be a presentation by uh, Patricia Jones of the High Speed Rail Authority. And then on the engineering aspects of the request for proposals, we're going to have Hans Van Winkle from Parsons Brinkerhoff make the presentation. And then I'll continue with the presentation beyond that to talk about the legal <coughs> and contractual conditions, the best value selection technique, uh, stipends, and then uh, offer you the board uh, recommendation. So at this time, uh, Pat Padilla. Okay, there you are. Thank you, Tom. Good morning, um, Vice Chair, as well as members of the Board and Chief Executive Officer, for the opportunity to present the Authority Small Business Program and Policy and address and highlight for you the aspects of the program that will be applicable to this initial design build project as committed, to the, as committed by the Board to ensure that both the program and the goal is applicable to all phases of your procurement process and process as well as contracting opportunities that um, present opportunities for small businesses, the 30% goal is well ingrained and incorporated into this initial uh, release for this design build project. The 30% small business goal is consistent and inclusive of the disadvantaged business enterprises, micro businesses, as well as disabled veteran business enterprises. The, what is calling out for is a mandatory outreach by the design build teams that are bidding and will be proposing on these projects to ensure that the teams are representative of the available diversity of our communities as it relates to industries and small business uh, opportunities. 
It also calls uh, for the design builder to develop and implement, which is probably one of the most crucial elements of the program, a performance plan that will lay out the strategies that they will employ to ensure and innovation and creativity to, in, to meet the overall 30% goal that the board has committed to ensure that uh, the communities have ample opportunity to participate. It will also include small business participation data gathering, which is essential to capture the utilization on an ongoing basis, not from their initial commitment, but rather beyond that. So initially, the design builders will and have in, uh, signed affidavits committing to, to demonstrate good faith efforts aggressively to meet the 30% goal, but they will also be required to submit monthly reports to demonstrate their attainments, and attainments will be based on dollars paid against each of those commitments. And as new firms are added on, as proje projects are, not projects, but rather packages are released for opportunities that they will comply with the small business program plan as it relates to those areas. Monthly oversight and monitoring will be performed by the authority to ensure prompt payment provisions are adhered to so that timely uh, payment of payments are made to small businesses. Another area that I overlooked in, in looking at my notes was the provision of ongoing technical assistance that must be afforded to small businesses to ensure their success on the project, a time, a, an area of kind of a teaming approach to ensure that they have a venue to address issues and get those re quickly remedied to move forward and be successful on the project. The program, as um, the emphasis of the program, basically complies with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act in, in all related statutes to ensure diversity of the availability of all the communities represented in this program. So that basically summarize, summarizes the highlights of the ESB program as well as the application of the goal. I, I think that what we ought to do is, uh, at each segment is completed, turn to questions or comments from the authority board. So. Uh, on this, uh, on the small business enterprise section, are there any? Yes, Mr. Umber. Um, thank you, Ms. Padilla. Uh, congratulations, by the way, on, on your program, creating the program for the High Speed Rail Authority. What are the sanctions if they, one, don't meet the goal, and two, with respect to payments? So payments made to one contractor with the assumption it's going to be made to, for example, small business. That doesn't happen. What are the sanctions? I, I'm going to turn this over to general counsel. I know that we will be having a mechanism where they will be providing monthly assurances that they have complied with prompt payment provisions that are set forth in the contract. And currently the authority is considering very stringent requirements um, in terms of um, subcontractor payments from the prime and receipt of payment greater than the California um, Public Contract Code of 10 days um, of receipt of payment. They actually are considering a seven day turnaround we will be asking them to provide assurances that they are in full compliance. So if a third party complaint is received, um, in terms of, uh, you know, it will be reviewed and they will be asked to provide evidence that they are in compliance. So that's as far as I can take it in terms of the program. In terms of uh, sanctions, I would need to turn that over to General Counsel. Um, we don't really have any specific sanctions per se. Um, it's an aspirational goal so that um, there wouldn't be the opportunity to have specific sanctions. So if I understand this correctly, somebody bids and they say we're going to meet the goal of whatever it may be, 30% small business, right? right? Yes. It turns out that they only meet 20%. There's no consequence. Well, well, during the RFP process, the, uh, the uh, plan, the small business plan will be part of the selection process for the um, RFP and uh, or for the proposals so in that manner we're going to be making sure that the that the plan itself will be um, implemented we can be implemented and it will be effective and then as uh, Ms. Padilla has said that we're going to have monitoring along the way also but oh, okay and maybe I don't understand it but but you get a bid someone says they're going to comply and they don't comply for whatever reason they don't comply they they're at the 20 percent or 15 percent or 2 percent can anything be done um, because it's just an aspirational goal, there, there wouldn't be uh, an opportunity to, to impose sanctions, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ouch, yeah. number one. No, number two, uh, with respect to payments, so the general gets paid or the prime gets paid and they don't pass that along to the, the subcontractor. Are there any sanctions there? 
Um, there are prompt payments. Yes, there are penalties associated with the 2%. Yes, the 2% per, per month. So okay. for the outstanding payments, there's a 2% application of liability to a contractor that, that does not comply. That's the California Public Contract Code. Separate and apart from that, the authority is likely to impose additional penalties associated with non-compliance. Okay, in that so area. we can impose. So, so let's say a subcontractor is owed $100,000 for whatever reason not paid $100,000, and it has nothing to do with their performance. Yeah. Uh, then the prime contractor gets assessed a 2% penalty. Is that right? I, they can get assessed a 2% penalty against the affected subcontractor or subconsultant not paid in conformance with that. Right. And, and that's by statute. Separate right. and apart from that, the authority can apply a 2% penalty for violations that are noted right. and identified. And who gets that 2% or 4% as the case may be? I imagine it would go back to the general fund, um, in that, but I'm not exactly positive. It doesn't go to the sub? No. no. That, there is an application of the 2% that will be paid to the sub, but separate and apart from what they are owed and what the contractor would be obligated to pay, the authority can impose an additional 2%, and it has been done in the past on other contracts. Oh. Okay. I, I think I'd like to just uh, point out, Mr. Jim, uh, Madam Chair and Mr. Umberg, one of the advantages we've got, obviously, on our program is we've got a repetition of, of these packages. So clearly... Uh, although these are goals that they have to achieve, in any further and next evaluation of, of bidders for the next rounds, uh, we have and can and will be able to do a completely different evaluation of those bidders if they do not meet the goals that they had originally set out. So, I mean, the advantage of a project like our high-speed rail project, which has got continuous contracts one after the other, is that we can consider all those in further and later evaluations. It, let me just ask a follow-on question. Then, in, in the evaluation, will we be asking um, with respect to their compliance in other state or federal contracts? Will that be part of the evaluation? Uh, yes, that is part of the evaluation. So that we're looking at their, their past history and their success in implementing these types of programs. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Richard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair. Um, I guess I'm confused a little bit. So it's not, we've, we've got a policy, but the, the uh, reaching that policy isn't based then on best effort. It's basically you, you meet the policy. Is that, is that what we're doing? In other words, a, sub, a contractor can say, well, I, I, I uh, extended the best efforts I could. I wasn't able to find. The, the contractors who meet the DB requirements, what happens in that case? I mean, is there still, are we still able to, um, to uh, cause this 2% two pe two penalty? H how does that work? We're talking about two things. Yeah. One is the prop payment um, mm -hmm. application, and then yeah. I believe what you're addressing, um, Director, is the failure to meet the overall goal and exercise okay, yes, good faith efforts to do so. There is going to be, as, as the Chief Executive Officer um, expressed in the program that you adopted, we definitively have ongoing monitoring efforts. We will be issuing notices to cure. The, it will be unsatisfactory in a breach of contract if they do not adhere to demonstrating good faith efforts to meet that goal. At the end of the day, is the, if the goal was not met, I, that's why I defer to the General Counsel to address those remedies that will be available or, or sanctions or penalties. But there will be a issue early on if they fail to meet the contract terms and conditions. And when they sign that at letter of affidavit, they are stating that they are committed to demonstrate and exercise good faith efforts aggressively to meet that goal. And whatever they do commit to at the time of award will be the goal of record because that is their commitment against their contract. So they may come in more ambitious than the 30% overall goal and state that they've committed to a 38%. That will be the goal of record that will be used as a barometer in okay. monitoring their performance. And as he said, it will be ongoing at every, f at every phase of the project. And if they are not pursuing it, they will have to rectify their performance plan to remedy and address it appropriately to meet those requirements. Great. Thank, thank you. It's the uh, answer I was looking right. for. But that's my <laughs> question. Or, or what? Or what? At the end of the day, if they do not and they fail to make good faith efforts to exercise to meet the goal, that's where you have an issue of noncompliance. If the contractor failed to meet the critical components. You don't, you don't penalize necessarily for not meeting the goal, 
What you do penalize for is the where they fail to meet their contractual obligations. So you terminate the contract? Well, I believe the breach of contract is always available, but most importantly, it may be, quite honestly, a situation where they committed to a 37% goal, operating with good, good intent to meet that goal, have fulfilled every aspect of, of what our standards and application are in evaluating a good faith effort, and at the end of the day, for whatever reason, a firm goes out of business, they couldn't do a substitution quick enough to readily address that issue and, and not disrupt schedule and, and a significant cost. There are a number of uh, factors that would be considered. They may come in, let's say, with a 28% goal. Would we still, at the end of the day, when I do a project closeout as it relates to this program, find them responsive? Yes, if those areas are acceptable and they, that I could demonstrate to you and you will be given monthly reports as requested earlier on, as to our review of their compliance relative to those areas. So it will not be a surprise, or it should not be a surprise that um, in any area that it hasn't been addressed. But there may be instances where it was found to be acceptable to not meet that target. Uh, unless there are other comments on this, I'd l on this particular issue, I I'd like to suggest that uh, the staff Yes, look at you, Tom. Uh, that you, can I, you, you can tell this is of importance to every member of this authority. Uh, that you flesh this out a little bit because I too am uncomfortable with nice words and goals, but um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, where, where is the stick? And uh, I, for one, would like to see that laid out in, in greater detail. It sounds like Mr. Umberg would and, and others. So uh, if, if we could get that uh, perhaps at the next meeting, um, I, I would appreciate that. Sure, we'll put that on the agenda for next meeting. Okay. Uh, any other members comment on, on this particular segment? Uh, uh, I'd just like to say that in my many years in government, I've seen this particular issue go you know, from being sort of an afterthought to being a central thought. And for this authority and for members that have preceded us here and the ones that are here today, this is a very, very important and integral part of this project. Uh, we want to see this be a model going forward. Uh, so in every aspect of the, uh, every sentence behind the words, we want to see the action. And uh, for example, Mr. Guerrero talked about uh, the uh, communication. and. Uh, for those of us who've been in small business, it, it really is a, a difficult stretch. So putting it on the website is terrific. But uh, where we say mandatory outreach by, by the primes competing, uh, I hope that we're going to really drill down and find out what their plan is to reach out. How are they going to reach these uh, small and businesses and micro businesses and disadvantaged businesses that Mr. Guerrero uh, was referencing in, in his remarks. So I, I guess in sum, I for one, who take this very seriously, as do my colleagues, want to see the, the, the specific plans, okay. not just the words. And I know you, you agree with that, Ms. Padilla. I do. You've done it. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. So uh, if we're done with this segment. Could I just add one point regarding um, the last comment you made? We are meeting with all the design builders, shortlisted firms, to go over these requirements with them. So that it will be a mandatory workshop that they attend. So okay. we will be doing that. Thank you. Tom, did you want to add something? No? Okay. Thank you. Okay. The next slide, uh, Patricia Jones will be presenting uh, the next one. On, on right away? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good morning, uh, Madam Vice Chair and Board Members and Mr. Van Ark. As Tom mentioned, I'm Patricia Jones with the Authority. And, uh, as, and also, as, as Mr. Fulenz mentioned, uh, uh, right away is on the critical path for this pa package. And the Authority is responsible for and uh, assuming the risk of right of way delivery. The risks include consistent funding availability, including legislative approvals for both the resources required to deliver the right of way and the cost of acquisition and relocation, environmental milestone approvals, level of acceptable streamlining processes for right-of-way approvals uh, through the Public Works Board. The general provisions of the design-build RFP will include requirements concerning right-of-way delivery, including but not limited to roles and responsibilities of the authority and the design-build contractor, 
administrative and reporting requirements, identification of additional right-of-way, the process and responsibilities, and demo and clearance. The RFP will include a right-of-way <coughs> excuse me, acquisition plan with a list of parcels within construction package 1A and B with 1C following after appropriate envi environmental milestones for the Fresno to Bakersfield document. The RFP also provides notice that acquisition of additional right-of-way requirements identified by the contractor, if any, may require up to 24 months lead time for access. Do you have uh, any questions that may I, I may address? Any questions, Mr. Umberg? Uh, just w one question, issue I've raised before, um, and I'm not sure if staff's explored or not. I, I understand we're going to contract with Caltrans to um, provide some of the personnel to acquire the right-of-way. On other projects, Caltrans has actually acquired the right-of-way and then transferred it to the entity. So for example, here, if we researched having Caltrans actually do the acquisition and then after it's acquired, then transfer it to High Speed Rail Authority? Yes, Caltrans has indicated they do not have the right-of-way resources to assist us in that manner. The resources that they have agreed to provide and the agreement is pending uh, are um, uh, attorneys who um, are practiced in eminent domain. So they, um, they can assist us in that manner. So Caltrans doesn't have the resources to be able to acquire the right of way? They don't. That's what they've told us. And, and we will? We, under our uh, right of way uh, RFP uh, that is pending, um, we will uh, have that in place by July 1st when we begin our um, acquisitions. Or uh, It's anticipated that after July 1st we'd be able to start making the first written offers and we will have um, our contractors in place at that time. Right now we have uh, for preliminary right of way activities including appraisals, we're um, handling that through our uh, regional consultants and they have subcontracted that right of way work through the, uh, okay. the two prime co contractors on the uh, segments. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Um, Mr. Umberg, th there is a paper that we prepared uh, and we'll send them to you uh, as board members. It's been prepared a while ago already, together with Caltrans, uh, Department of Finance and ourselves, and in which we did an investigation as to whether Caltrans was in a position to do this work on our behalf. Um, there are some differences between how Caltrans has to do their work and also their workload and it is correct they do not have the capacity. The issue is too that Caltrans cannot subcontract this type of work which we can by statute. We have a different, uh, we're in a different position and we need in the short term uh, uh, say approximately 100 people to do this work for us. Uh, the report references all of this and uh, the common understanding between all of us is that they cannot in the short term uh, meet that requirement and I think that's one of the reasons why the statute was written in that way knowing that high speed rail is going to have one big peak load for a period of time and uh, that is how we are set up at this stage using external contractors. Uh, there was mention of it before uh, there's a, a right of way services uh, uh, RFP that is being uh, prepared at the moment so such services will be done externally and I hope by small businesses as well uh, and will be done externally whereas Caltrans has to do most of those services in-house. Any and other? I, I just wanted to add that there's another agenda item coming up that uh, is approval for a right-of-way legal services contract as you know and so that was with Caltrans so we have reached out just to the legal division they do have the resources to provide that assistance that we think is at a uh, a good uh, price for the High Speed Rail Authority. So that's the distinction between the right of way agent work, agent work versus the, the legal work. Yes. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jones. Just one yes. quick comment with regards to both your, your current uh, consultant who's helping as well as the whoever you uh, move towards selecting for the RFP. I would just only strongly um, ask you to consider that the professionals that whoever the right-of-way agent happens to be, but the professionals have local experience in the areas where the right-of-way that they're, they're dealing with and those property owners. I think it will provide for a faster resolution uh, in this process and I think more accurate information. So um, it probably is what you're already thinking about, but I think it's really important to basically use appraisers from the areas that the right of way is going through because they truly have the best information. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, 
like to add, uh, I have the highest regard for Caltrans's right-of-way acquisition experience, so everything that we can do to call on them, I mean, this is going to be the biggest project in California, and uh, you know, if, if we need them, we ought to figure out a way to uh, get those resources from them. And uh, I can just uh, wish you luck, having been involved in so like the Century Freeway, the 105, uh, it looks like a great plan, but it's always the unexpected mm -hmm. that uh, trips you up. So uh, Caltrans has that experience, and I would urge you to be in close touch with them on this. All right, thank, thank you, you, Tom. The next segment. Okay, uh, Hans Van Winkle will Hans. from uh, Parsons Brinkerhoff will be presenting the next one. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the board, uh, Good morning. My task is to very briefly, I have one slide, uh, to talk you through some very technical and very complex issues. Uh, again, as, as Tom has mentioned earlier, we did have a chance to, to talk to most of you and, and cover some of these areas. Uh, so I'll just very briefly go over some what we believe to be some critical points. Uh, let me start off by saying is that this is our first uh, design bill contract going out. So we've taken this very seriously of, of putting a best effort. We want to make sure that we get the first contract out, uh, the document, uh, the engineering, the, the technical aspects are done properly. Uh, to that end, we've gone to many other partners in designing this document, designing this system. And in particular, uh, we, we've looked to Caltrans, uh, who has begun a design-build program, as you know. That's in the early stages, but we've looked at their documents. We've also gone out and looked uh, nationwide. There are many other design-build uh, contracts of this nature. So we use them as a guide to help us uh, help us formulate this particular document. I would tell you that that uh, doing the engineering and the technical is a team effort by all of us. I've been uh, it's been a priority for us. Uh, we've spent the last uh, well, it's been it's been literally years in putting this document together. I'd like to publicly acknowledge uh, Ken Jong, who's our senior engineer and one of our deputy program managers, who's uh, who's done the yeoman's work in putting the, all this all together. Thousands of pages of. Uh, plans, drawing documents, and specifications. Uh, John Popoff, who's our deputy program manager and responsible for construction in the north and also for the initial construction segments. I know many of you have been dealing with him directly. And then also our, uh, our commercial team, Teddy Blunk and Bryce Little, who've, who've done a lot of the work putting this together. Uh, so many thanks to them. In addition to our team, we've had a very able uh, group of uh, regional contractors, as you know. Uh, and essentially what we've done is our regional contractors working on the ground uh, doing the 15 percent design documents and the environmental documents have put out the initial alignment. We call that the 15 percent design. Uh, based on your decisions on a preferred uh, alignment, preferred alternative, uh, we've then taken that initial design and furthered the design in very specific areas, areas where we expect problems, a, a, a footing, a structure of that nature. And we've advanced that design so that when we put out a procurement document, then our, our bidders, our potential contractors, our shortlisted firms have, have a good notion of what it is they're going uh, to be bidding on uh, and have sort of a head start in doing all that. So that's the sense of the team of how we've produced the, the technical documents. And again, this is pretty standard and nothing particularly unique other than the fact of the size and complexity of this project. And I'll also say some of the technical specifications. Uh, we have to be much more precise than in some other types of projects because, again, we're going to be going along at uh, 220 miles an hour. So many of the specifications have to be very, very, very tight. So that's added some complexity to the, pro to the, to the project. Uh, let me state then, uh, we've produced those documents, the technical documents, the drawings. Our team has provided the design criteria manual and then we've provided these in the RFP to the contractors. They will then take those documents, do their own design, uh, and uh, we should mention that the contractors do have responsibility under design bill contract uh, to meet our performance standards and come up with an appropriate design. I'll talk just a moment about our, our, our certification process. Uh, in our quality control process, but it is the responsibility of the contractor, the successful bidder, to produce a design that meets our performance specifications. Now, I will say that, uh, that there is some prime responsibility that cannot be shifted uh, to the design bill contractors, and that's really in a second bullet here where you see that environmental approvals, there are also permits that have to be acquired, uh, utility relocations, uh, third-party agreements, 
All of those, uh, we'll be using our successful bidder to assist us in producing uh, those permits and documents, but we retain uh, ultimate responsibility to produce those. And of course, the most important one is the environmental appro approval process, which we're going through now. A little later in the presentations today, you'll hear a little bit more about our progress on Fresno Bakersfield. And in the coming uh, board meetings uh, in the next couple of months, we'll be presenting to you more information about the Merced uh, Fresno piece, uh, which we're, we're moving very, very uh, rapidly toward uh, achieving that uh, very important nod and rod, which again is our responsibility to our contractors. I should mention also that all this technical work uh, throughout, we've been keeping our federal partners, the FRA, informed, and there's been an exchange of documents. They've reviewed all of our 15% documents, and then the documents that have moved forward, they've been provided to them. We've had some good technical discussions back and forth. So our federal partners have been fully informed in what we're doing. Uh, I've mentioned already that in this process, the, uh, the, the winner, uh, the poten our potential design bill contractor, does have responsibility uh, for the design meeting performance standards. And that's very important. We're very fortunate. We've got uh, five firms now that are still in the running that will receive this RFP. Uh, they are what I consider to be world-class firms. Uh, the design build process is designed to let them use their best practices, their uh, good engineering. Uh, we've done a lot of preliminary work, but they will bring on additional teams that will provide additional technical expertise. Uh, so the design build process is really designed to allow them to use all of their best efforts, their best technical knowledge, their best engineers. And we'll be certainly looking for that as we assist the authority in, in, in selecting the best design build contractor for us. Now, in spite of having that responsibility, we, of course, in the authority, have to maintain a good quality control procedure. Now, we do have a self-certification process. It's very important in the design build process that, that the that the contractor be allowed to move forward without impediments. Of course, time, as you know, is a constraint, and that's one of the advantages of a design-build contract. But we will maintain uh, quality control, quality assurance systems. Uh, principally, we will have a self-certification process and an independent checking engineer, which will be checking uh, all of the documents. There will be a sealed document, uh, a stamped document on each, each of the designs, and that independent checking engineer will continue to follow the design builder through the process. In addition to that independent checking engineer and the quality control process, we will maintain an audit responsibility within the authority and our intent is to have about a 10% check on documents, drawings, and, and progress. Uh, should, we, uh, should we determine there are some quality problems as we move forward in either design or the construction, then we have mechanism at our disposal to move in and we can uh, demand uh, additional quality control processes. We can st take, a, take additional steps. So we'll be monitoring that very, very closely. Uh, the final point I'd make is that, again, because we do have these excellent firms, world-class firms, uh, we do want to take advantage of their knowledge. And early on, we'll be using both alternative technical concepts uh, that we will be working closely uh, with the firms, determining if, in fact, they have better ideas, if we, if we accept those or not. And then throughout the process, we'll certainly encourage value engineering to include uh, cost savings proposals throughout the process. Uh, so overall, we feel very confident that we have a, a good product to put out to our uh, design builders. We'll be working with them. Uh, they'll be submitting RFIs, uh, technical RFIs, uh, as they proceed to produce their estimate for us. Uh, and we're very confident that we're going to have some, some excellent proposals uh, at the end of the day, end up with an excellent design builder to help us with the first stage of construction. Uh, that ends my uh, presentation. I'd take any questions that you have. I have one, uh, the, the FRA, would you just uh, take a little deeper dive on what their role is, how active, I mean, do they just look at what we submit or uh, have they given uh, feedback that was in any way surprising, uh, different from what we had planned, what, what is their role in this? Well, they've, in fact, looked at each and every document that we've had, and we've had a, a considerable number of uh, comments from them, and those then are resolved. Uh, uh, at, at sort of the individual level. So I'd say we've had a good relationship. I don't believe, remember the 15% design is sort of an alignment. Uh, there's not a detailed design at this point. So the principal purpose we want with the 15% is get a good alignment. Mm -hmm. So there have been some questions and comments back and forth. I would characterize our working relationship as very positive, very good. Uh, I don't think there are any issues that have not been resolved uh, between the two of us. So I think in that respect we're in good shape. Okay, thank you. And Madam Chair, I would like to uh, repeat as well, we have a very close working relationship and, and uh, 
There's been nothing really surprising that's come out of that, the review of all the documentation. I mean, they've been um, very thorough and, and critical, and, but there's nothing new that's come out. We've just had to, it's more like a quality check, mm -hmm. quality control, and, uh, and they do it very thoroughly. But it's a day-to-day -day thing. I mean, people sometimes m misunderstand, but we really have got a day-to-day -day working relationship with the federal government, federal railroad administration. Um, and uh, on the pure technical side, there's not that much they can help us on because, you know, we have high-speed rail experts, which maybe they do not have that many on. But definitely on the procedural process side, they very much uh, help us and make sure that we're going to have the right oversight uh, of the project. Good. Thank you. I just yes. wanted to, to add to that that the uh, FRA sent uh, one of their attorneys out here to be present during the RFQ process where we shortlisted the, fir the five proposal firms. So they spent uh, several, this attorney spent several days uh, with the RFQ evaluation team and the subcommittees understanding what the process is and overseeing the process or, and as an observer and then reported back to FRA. So they were, they were quite involved. Uh, they've also uh, been a part of the development of the RFP documents themselves because we, we set them up on a, on a site that they can access and we plugged them in very early in the process. So they've been continuing to give us comments over um, uh, months. Great. Thank you. Good to know. Thank you, Hans. I just wanted to continue with um, just some legal contractual oversight and as you know you, you have a, a lot of detail in the, in the term sheets and uh, all those individual uh, items are covered in there and as you mentioned Madam Chair uh, I did reach out with, with others at the high speed rail and with consultants to, to inform you on some of the details and answer your questions and um, not only was FRA involved and included in this whole development of the RFP, the Department of Finance at the state level was, Department of General Services, and, and the Attorney General's Office has been helping us. And I want to mention that there are some other consultants that have been quite involved uh, other than uh, the team that uh, Hans had mentioned, and, and that is a KPMG, the financial uh, group that we have as consultants, has been part of the RFP process uh, the entire time uh, and the RFQ process. And uh, in addition to that, the Nossaman Law Firm has provided quite a bit of uh, expert uh, advice and been very involved. So we've, we've had a, a large team, um, lots and lots of hours developing this really important document. Um, the the uh, RFP follows the Design Build Institute of America process. Uh, we've also reached out to Caltrans because of their experience. Um, although they have really uh, a long history of design bid build, they have received the authority under statute to do design build uh, a few years ago. So they have developed a design build program starting from scratch. And so we've taken advantage. I happen to have some contacts over there in, the, in their legal division and also the uh, project manager for their design build program. And so we've, we've had uh, a number of occasions to consult with them. So that's been very helpful. Uh, I wanted to mention that, um, again, that the Public Works Board uh, has to approve this RFP uh, as well as this board and uh, just to let you know the the Public Works Board staff consists of Department of General Services and Department of Finance staff and and so they are very familiar with and they have experience in design build and so they've been um, plugged in um, for months uh, on this process and give us uh, given us a lot of feedback I want to talk about the uh, best value selection process that we're moving forward with for the selection of the uh, proposal team that we would move on to the award. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, this sure. going back to the, the legal for, oh, yes. for a moment. Sorry, yes. just had a little si a sidebar here. Sure. Uh, it's amazing with all the lawyers that we got this done. Yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, let's see what. What? Very good lead. We have an excellent, excellent lead. Uh, so y you are the, the lead attorney for us on all this and coordinating all yes. the, the, and it all comes back to you? Right, yes. Okay, because I, I want to know who to blame, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, it does. Um, I've been very actively involved with all the, the consultant groups that I mentioned, uh, PM, the PMT, uh, the PMO, KPMG, 
No, I no the whole alphabet. Every, everybody, yeah. Okay. So, so I've been trying to coordinate okay. that, uh, or have been coordinating coordinating that, and so it's been uh, quite a big effort. Okay. Uh, there's many, many conference calls and face-to-face -face meetings. It's been uh, very, very intense yes. to, to try to put something this complex together. Well, you must be doing something right with all the lawyers on this board, and no questions. <laughs> 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 thanks. Please okay. move on. Okay, thanks. Uh, the uh, selection process for the best value uh, RF, uh, proposal is, is going to be um, a best value selection, and it's a, it's a, a technical and price component. And we had a lot of um, in, internal discussion on what the best way to approach this so that we end up with uh, a strong technical uh, proposal team as well as a, a very fair and competitive price. Um, so we, we looked to the federal acquisition regulations and, and followed those. And we looked at also examples of technical price weighting for design build contractor selections for other types of projects um, throughout the United States. And so we, we settled on, on this approach. We're going to have, uh, there are five proposal teams and we hope and, and are confident that there will be five proposals submitted. And so the first um, evaluation process will be to go through and uh, have a technical evaluation. And these are the weightings that we'll put on the various subject areas that we'll be looking at. Project approach, safety, conceptual engineering, ability to meet the schedule, anticipated problems and solutions, and quality and self-certification. And you can see the representative weightings that we're going to have. These are broad categories, and within them, there are other categories. For instance, you don't see here uh, the small business program, and because that's in part of the project approach. So there are many subcategories within these major categories. When the technical evaluation in a design build procurement is done, the, usually there are very broad categories like this. We're going to have um, this first approach. We're going to rate them. And we're going to take the top three out of the five to move on to the next part of the, of the competition for selection. Um, if we have only four proposals, we again will just go with the top three. If we had two proposals, or pardon me, three proposals, we'll just select the top two to move on to the next price component. Okay. Uh, so that's, uh, we narrow the field the top three and, and we move on, or the top two technical if there's only three. Okay. Then, then we move on to what's called the uh, price consideration. Although it, it, it actually folds back in the technical proposals that we received, but now we only weighted at 30% and the price component is a full uh, 70%. The, the uh, same uh, five or no, six categories are in the technical propos proposal piece, that's 30%. Uh, by, by creating a competition for the technical piece, we think we're going to get strong technical proposals and we're going to get some very well thought out plans from these proposal teams. And we're making it very competitive because, because if you don't, you're not in the top three, you'll be dropped off. And then we move to the price, and because it's more heavily weighted in price on this second phase, we think we'll get some very good competition and get uh, a very fair and reasonable price. And uh, as I mentioned before, we looked at other projects uh, throughout the United States, and uh, the Design Build Institute, we, we um, are following uh, principles in that manual. I, there's a quote there that um, shows um, one type of procurement approach that could be taken, although um, ours will be a little different than that, but we, we looked into the uh, Design Build Institute for guidance. And then also we looked at these particular projects as uh, good examples. This is a uh, Caltrans Design Build Program where for their largest design build project, which is the Gerald Desmond Bridge, they had this, uh, this uh, scoring plan which was uh, 70 to 80 percent price and 20 to 30 percent uh, Technical, technical, and that project was uh, about $700 million. Uh, Denver's RTD, Denver Eagle 3P rail project uh, had a price and technical split, as you see, 60 and 40. And then finally, Dallas uh, Area Rapid Transit Orange Line had a 
point uh, price and a 65 point uh, technical. So you can see there are very many variations that you could select, but we chose this method because we thought we would accomplish uh, the goals of the authority best. I want to move on to uh, stipends. Well, what, what, okay. are there any sure. questions or comments up to this point? Okay. Yes, Mr. Harding. Uh, as to the, uh, um, the ability to evaluate the proposals and our capacity to do so, I know you and I talked about that, but would you, could you uh, provide us a little bit more detail on how, how the, who's involved in the evaluation process and how that works? Okay. Um, this is similar to the, to the RFQ evaluation process that we just uh, went through, and, and it will mimic it, except it will be uh, much more time commitment. Um, when you evaluate these proposals in the state system, they, there have to be state employees that, that are part of the evaluation team that make the final decisions on uh, the scoring. So we're going to reach out to other public entities and um, uh, also use high-speed rail staff. What I did for the RFQ process is I, I reached out to other transportation agencies. I had uh, Caltrans participate. I had a Contra, Costa Orange, uh, Contra Costa County Transportation Authority participate. Uh, there was someone from Department of General Services because they uh, are overseeing our whole procurement process and must report to the, um, to the uh, Public Works Board. Um, DOF was involved in it. And uh, also I had high-speed rail staff uh, from the engineering side and from the uh, finance side. We then had, uh, this was a five-member evaluation team, and that's what we plan to have for this RFP. Feeding into uh, and helping and assisting this five-person evaluation team, we're going to have subcommittees with uh, areas of specialty. For instance, we'll have a small business uh, group consisting of consultants and high-speed rail staff who are uh, working on this uh, small business program. And then we're also going to have some engineering that will uh, consist of consultants. And uh, the last procurement, we had some assistance from Caltrans engineers. And then we also had a, a legal um, group that provided legal advice. And we reached out to the Nossaman Law Firm, who is uh, world renowned for their expertise in procurements in the legal area. And um, so, so we have these, we, these committees that uh, are kind of do the work for the uh, evaluation committee. And they have specific tasks that they're supposed to do in the evaluation process. For instance, in the RFQ, there was a pass-fail component, and we had a pass-fail subcommittee. And then they made a recommendation on the pass-fail to the, to the, the, uh, the uh, evaluation committee itself. And then they um, adopt or modify that recommendation. Ultimately, um, when you get to the decision uh, point, on making the selection, it would go to the CEO for approval, uh, and then to you as the board. Any other Up to this point, no. Okay, then we can move on okay. to the stipend. Okay, the, the stipend. The purpose of the stipend is to defray engineering and other costs in return for the submission of a, of a responsive proposal, and we're proposing to um, seek your authority to pay up to $2 million per proposal that is not selected for award. Um, if for some reason the award is canceled, that it would be for all proposals that would be submitted. But we have some criteria that, we're, that we would um, use as benchmarks in order to pay the stipend. First of all, it has to be an acceptable proposal, and we'll have some rigid requirements as to what would be that uh, acceptable standard. And then we also have to uh, receive proof that they, in fact, uh, incurred those types of costs. Uh, we've looked at industry standards and we see that stipends fall uh, between 0.1 and 0.2 percent range of the estimated contract value. That's an industry standard. So this $2 million per stipend is, is within that range. And uh, from reaching out to the industry, we have um, understand that it, they could, there could be an expense of about six, up to $6 million per proposal for this type of procurement. So this is a partial reimbursement for the expenses that uh, the design build teams have gone through. But uh, another a important aspect of this is that the authority is actually acquiring um, the full proposals that are submitted. 
and they can use those proposals for, uh, for any purpose that they have. So for instance, it could be used, if it's a non-successful proposal, it could be used and shared with the success successful proposers for innovative ideas that may be contained in there. It could be used for future procurements, and we're going to have a number of those, as I mentioned, in the Central Valley. So there's a great, they, this, these proposals are of, nice, of good value to the, to the um, High Speed Rail Authority. And um, um, that's why we're proposing that we do this. And I'd just like to add, if I may, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, it's quite normal in the state system. I mean, Caltrans also use stipends uh, very similar to this in the same uh, magnitude uh, for their bids, also design bid builds, uh, design bid, uh, bid, design build bids. Uh, so it's not an abnormal thing, and of course uh, you must understand that uh, under the present condition on high-speed rail, this is a necessity to ensure that we are going to uh, retain the maximum competitiveness on this bid, and that we can get those five bid bidder groups that we've got to bid on this particular project. So I really recommend that, uh, that the board uh, look favorably upon this uh, request. Any other questions or comments? On this? Yes, Mr. Richards. Thank you. Um, so with regards to the determination of how much a proposer gets on a stipend, Tom, it will be, I assume, then up to that proposer to prove up their hard costs to, up at least to the $2 million level? Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Any other? Uh, are there any other segments? Oh, sorry. sorry Mr. Balgonor. Only, only to the $2 million level? Uh, only to the $2 million level. Yeah, that's the, the maximum spent. And it would be less than that if they could prove, if they only prove less. Or if we got a partial proposal, for instance, um, we would have to audit the information that they, would, that they would provide to see what the appropriate amount would be. Yeah, I, I was just uh, thinking, it, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you be better off to have something where you get, they get a percentage? So if, if it's going to cost people $6 million to do this and we're, we're going to reimburse them at two, then, then I can see that there's, you know, that there's a reason to do that. But if the person only spent two, uh, I don't. It, that doesn't look like they've got any risk. Looks like they could. It looks like what they could do is uh, just go out and keep their people working with no downside as long as they didn't ex exceed it. It seems like there should be a, a percentage. Well. We uh, look at the entire proposal. The proposal has to be complete and acceptable. So we have standards that we look at to uh, determine whether the proposal is warranted to receive the stipend. So there's that test, and then we also have a test to show what exactly they spent for it. So, Member Belganor, that's correct. Uh, you know, if, if a bid comes in uh, of an inferior quality, uh, the uh, bidder does not get two million, even if they prove two million in costs. But uh, you know the, the quality of the bid has to be such that uh, it warrants the payment of, of oh, the stipend. All right, that makes me more comfortable. Any more questions or comments on? Just, uh, yes. And and with respect to the evaluation as to the appropriateness of the bid, that's the evaluation committee, or is that a different decision-making body that makes that determination as to the appropriate level of stipend? That would be a different committee that we would have to look at that. It would be what I'm a saying? Different, different, a, a different, different, a different group, yeah. And okay. it would be, it would be a high-speed rail staff would be involved. We'd maybe seek assistance from a consultants, but really would be a state staff decision on that. Okay, thank you. Right. Does that conclude? The, um, you have see. one more. Yeah, okay. Okay, well we do have a resolution that we're asking you to consider and let me just kind of go through the points there. Uh, the first would be to approve the RFP for construction package one, number one, based upon the term sheet provisions that you've been provided. Uh, and then this uh, I hadn't discussed before, but we also are asking that the high-speed rail CEO can make non-substantive changes to the term sheet provisions in consultation with the board chair. And we wanted to leave this uh, an opportunity to make what we de uh, determined to be non-substantive changes so that we don't have to continue to come to the board uh, every time some change is made because as um, Mr. Van Winkle had indicated, it's a large voluminous document and there will be adjustments uh, along the way. There will be addendums uh, most likely issued uh, as appropriate along this whole procurement process. 
and then we're asking for approval of a stipend up to two million dollars per acceptable proposal for proposal teams not awarded the contract tract or if the contract is canceled prior to award and then uh, finally we're asking approval for the three-step RFP evaluation criteria that I had described so does that conclude your yes, it does. presentation okay uh, any additional questions or comments uh, at no, not on this. No public comment on this. Uh, well, a, a couple, as I said uh, before we got started, each one of us uh, were able to review and study the, the term sheet and, and make some, some comments. Uh, one that may seem small that I overlooked but uh, is big in, the, in terms of the members of this authority, under indemnity, mm -hmm. uh, we say that the contractor will fully defend, indemnify, hold harmless the authority and all of its directors, officers, etc. As I recall, we in the statute are referred to as members, not directors. So if you could take a look at that and sure. if that is the way, we want to make sure we protect ourselves too. Absolutely, here. sure. I can take a look at that. <laughs> I thought you'd think that. Uh, I always get uh, looking at the big picture, didn't look at the this, this small. Uh, from and, and I know we've brought this up before, but just a little bit more on the timeline, which seems sure. ambitious to me. You know, from the RFP to the right of way to completing, I, this, this looks like a pretty robust timeline. Uh, so I'd like to, I guess, to hear Roloff from you too, since you've been involved in this, and, and Tom, uh, the, your comfort level with our being able to meet this timeline uh, with knowing th that there are going to be un unknowns down the road here? Um, I certainly won't represent that it will be easy to accomplish. Um, uh, what we've done through the design build procurement though is we believe we are shifting a lot of those risks uh, to the contractor, the design builder as appropriate in design build procurements. Uh, for instance, um, uh, utilities and, and um, uh, hazardous waste and many of the things, uh, ge geotechnical um, uh, issues, many of those things that the uh, High Speed Rail Authority, uh, if it was a design bid build, might uh, retain as risks, we're shifting over because they are the designers, the design build firms, and they will have to um, manage those risks themselves. So. Uh, we have had the one-on-ones with the design build teams and they believe they can and have represented that they can stay within the schedule as, as represented in, in the term sheets. Um, we have um, or we're planning on uh, the award at the end of 2012 so that would be probably December of 2012. Uh, they'll be performing the design part of this procurement uh, probably till the summer of 2013. We're giving them a 30% design and as you see in the term sheet, they can uh, accept those, that, that design. Uh, we're not um, retaining any risks associated with those designs if they have mistakes or, or those sort of problems. They can use them as they see fit or start over. They, they obviously will use them. Uh, then they take it from 30 to 100% design and then they, they can start their construction phase. However, because of its, its design build, they have the opportunity to start construction before they actually reach 100% design and probably will likely do so to gain some time. So they can design one portion, let's say they start in the north, they can design one portion and they can start construction following that while they're designing uh, in the south direction. And that's an advantage in design build where they have all those risks. If an owner were to procure it in that manner, they would have a higher risk because they retain design risks. Um, they'll be uh, working on this project for a 36 month period. Uh, that's the time that they are allowed. And uh, as you know, we have liquidated damages following that. But the completion date would be in mid uh, 2016. And as you know, the era funds have uh, a termination date. And we have about one year between the uh, time of completion under this contract and the, the end of our opportunity to acquire those 
uh, ERA funds through seeking re reimbursement from the federal government. So there is, there is that time available there. If they were to run over during that time, they are assessed liquidated damages. So, the, so our costs associated with those delays would be paid. So um, th th there are tight timelines, but there, there is some opportunity because of the, the uh, additional year before the termination of the, of the ERA funds where we think um, uh, that gives us some comfort. Okay. So, so Madam Chair, you asked my opinion and yes, it is a tight schedule. On the other hand, you know that we have constantly said to you as the board and to the public that we need to continue to march on and stick to this uh, timeline. And that's why we want to go out with this RFP and that's why we believe we need to stick to this and get the contract in place by the end of uh, 2012. That's been uh, what we've promised the board and the people for a long time. And uh, as Tom Falenz has just indicated to you, uh, the way, and we spoke to all five uh, pre-qualified bidders, uh, they believe that 36 months is what they need to do this work. Um, and that leaves us another additional 12 months beyond that before we actually run into the difficult time of, of, of uh, meeting the ARA funding requirements. Don't forget we also still have FY10 funding which is not directly linked to the 2017 uh, due date or a date of usage. So uh, we wanted to use that in particular for the track work which is the last package, the fifth of the five packages. But um, we cannot give up any moment. I mean uh, right away acquisition is very important. That's why we chose also to have uh, Patricia present, present that to you. Uh, we have to continue on this timeline because uh, this can be done. Uh, don't forget, uh, in 10 years, the Chinese have built about uh, uh, 6,000 miles of, uh, of high-speed rail line complete. And uh, I know we often say we don't want to do it the Chinese way, but uh, it's just an indication of physically what can be done. You know, physically this can be done. And the contractors have confirmed with us as well that physically the 36 months can be achieved. They can do it. Uh, that's what we are basing our uh, work on as well. I think it's, uh, it's, it's possible and we want to continue to make it happen. Okay. Well, it, I hope you're right. Yeah, and in, in the evaluation process, as you saw in the technical weighting, we do consider uh, schedule certainty as one of the components that we'll use to evaluate the proposer. So we want to see a very uh, realistic and aggressive schedule. Uh, one of the proposer teams indicated to us that they think they could accomplish it in less than the 36 months. So we're, we're counting on their um, innovative thought and approach and you know, we're hopeful. There's also uh, additional contracts coming out. So the performance um, um, by in this contract uh, could be beneficial uh, for the High Speed Rail Authority in learning how we might streamline other contracts that are following this one. Uh, that would be a benefit and uh, I think the industry may learn from that too and maybe give us better uh, and accurate and timely procurements uh, for packages uh, two through five. Okay. And, and all of this is in one resolution? You're, you're yes, we put it all in one, one resolution. And you feel comfortable that the stipend can be included in the resolution? Uh, yes. Feeling with it. Okay. Yes. Uh, so the, the way we're uh, going to proceed on this, we, uh, Mr. Umberg has asked that we delay the vote uh, for uh, well, for just some period of time, we'll do the vote today before the end of the session, but not right now. Okay. Uh, the, and uh, what we'll do is, uh, some, uh, let's see, we have a request for public comment, and usually the green slip has to be in by a time certain uh, to speak on an item, uh, but I don't think that was announced by the chair today, so uh, I will... Uh, allow this, uh, 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 Mr. Richard, is it Tomash? Tomac? Yes. And, and if I could just say, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, if when you fill out these uh, forms in the future, please print so that uh, the, the chair or whoever's sitting in the chair can read the name without <laughs> embarrassment. <laughs> All right, Mr. Tomac. Um, uh, sorry for my handwriting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Richard Tomac, uh, President of the California Rail Foundation. I, I wanted to um, compliment staff for including in the process a means of capturing at least half of the um, 
savings from value engineering. Uh, that's an important feature. Um, I, I think it's 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 a good thing to look into um, how much you can save and perhaps make um, that a critical factor in um, award of the uh, the contract. Uh, having said that. Um, I'm afraid, uh, like Mr. Bogganorth, that the, uh, the stipend is a little bit generous for this particular piece of work. I don't know if you, you remember the Texas High Speed Rail Project did do a similar stipend, and I think it amounted to two million for the entire Texas proposal. So uh, maybe costs have gotten out of control since then, but uh, it seems a little bit rich to me. Um, what my main concern is about this process is that um, the bidder groups already exclude most of the worldwide talent. Uh, there's no French company, there's no German company, there's no Japanese company associated with any of these five groups. I have great concerns that um, the remaining groups are actually capable of doing a world standards line. Um, and the insiders still dominate the process. If you, you know, um, the, the same club is in control. And I think this is the thing we have to worry about. Um, recently, you know, the, the Beijing Times talked about the, the problems that led to this, their system of corruption there. Uh, and they say, I'll, you know, here's a quote. Although the system is intended to ensure quality and safety has become a tool for corruption with small and no companies easily passing certification tests while experienced and reputable com companies have been denied with no reasonable explanation. Um, <clears throat> the open bid program is a, fa a facade, said Beijing Times, as the ministry can actually specify certain companies without the rest of technical capacities, enabling them to collude on which competitors to exclude from the market. I feel this has happened in our project, and I think it's the thing we have to be most worried about. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Tolman. Okay. Uh, so I think what we'll do... Uh, someone want to sing or play the violin? <laughs> Are we ready to proceed? Ready to we, don't, we don't want to do anything without our lawyer present. Sorry? We don't want to do anything without our lawyer present. Right. No, here he, here he is. Here he is. The man in the bullseye. Okay. All right. So now it's, uh, right. we're at the point where uh, we're ready for a motion on the resolution. I move we adopt the resolution as submitted. Is there a second? Second. Right. Are there any additional comments? Hearing none, we're ready to, uh, you, you look puzzled, uh, Mr. Fellows. Okay. Is there something that you'd like to um, say? I'm sorry, no. No. Uh, no, okay, no. Okay, we're, we're good. All right, uh, would the secretary call the roll, please? Mr. Richards? Yes. Ms. Schenk? Yes. Mr. Balgenor? Yes. Mr. Burns? I'm going to abstain. Mr. Hartnett? Yes. Mr. Umberg? Aye. Okay, so I think we can uh, resume and call our chair back into the room.